Good evening. Um, as part of the Atlas in LA, a nine-day festival of films by Charles Atlas, tonight we have early collaborations. Um, the works that will be shown in order, Nevada, 1974, Floor, 1974, Roman One, 1980, Channel Inserts, 1982, Blue Studio, 1975, Joints for Ensemble, 1971, View on Camera, 2003, and The Grand Dance of the Jolly Three in 1973. Okay, so this evening is early collaborations between Charles Atlas and choreographers Merce Cunningham and Douglas Dunn. In these early collaborations, Atlas began to explore the relationship of the body and movement and the camera, such as a single leg joint flexing in joint quartet for ensemble, or a body moving across a dance studio and floor. The relationship between space and movement complicates and channel inserts as Atlas documents Cunningham's dances with a rapidly moving steady cam conveying different actions happening simultaneously in different spaces. This is furthered even more as space and movement become digital in Blue Studio, in which Cunningham is multiplied, overlaid, and transported from the studio to a series of un unexpected landscapes. Tonight will also be the Los Angeles release of Charles's first monograph published by Prestel, developed in close collaboration with the artist. This vivid book captures the movement and pace of his time-based practice and includes, it includes essays by Douglas Crimpt, as well as interview by Stuart Comer. This book is being sold in the bookstore for um, a one night launch price of $60. And Charles will also be around afterwards to be signing books. I also wanted to give a special shout out to um, Lauren Whittles, who has been working with Charles on this book since. Yeah, she's been working with Charles on this book from the initial conception over eight and a half years ago. So this has definitely been a project that's been building over time. Um, we will begin this evening with a conversation with Charles and longtime friend Lori Weeks. A little bit of background on both of them. Charles's practice is firmly rooted in the moving image. It is most famous for works that blur the line between experimental dance documentation, performance, and performance for the camera. In his 40-year career, he has produced dance films, experimental videos, and documentary features. He has collaborated extensively with other artists, dancers, and choreographers, including Marina Abramovic, Anthony and the Johnsons, Lee Bowery, Michael Clark, Merce Cunningham, and Yvonne Rayner. Charles was, was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1949 and has lived and worked in New York City since the 1970s. His work has been exhibited in permanent collections such as the, um, the Tate Modern in London, Museum of Modern Art in New York, Center of Pompidou in Paris, Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, the Whitney Museum in New York, and the New Museum in New York. Let me get Laurie's. By what's on, on my phone. Just give me a second. Lori Weeks is a writer, performer, pataphysicist, and teacher, and a good time gal. She is the founder of the Institute of Aesthetic Juvenile Delinquents and Stuff. Delinquency. Delinquency, I apologize. That's okay. And Stuff. And her critically acclaimed first novel, Zipper Mouth, was honored with the International Lambda Literary Award for Best Debut Novel among four, five shortlisted for the Triangle, the Edmund White Award. Zipper Melt appears on numerous most notable and top 10 book lists for 2011 and 2012, and a German edition is forthcoming. A portion of this novel has appeared in the 2008 Dave Edgar's yearly anthology, The Best American Non-Required Reading, 
Weeks is among the names shortlisted for the Le Tigre hit single, Hot Topic, and in 1999, she toured the country with Sister Spit, an assemblage of post-punk performers led by Michelle T. Weeks was contributing writer on the film Boys Don't Cry. Her fiction essays, interviews, and collaborations with visual artists have appeared in the US and Europe, um, to name a few, including essay with um, Pussy, the book Pussy Riot. In 2006, um, Weeks directed the original Incarnation of Hell, an opera with Eileen Miles, and she did a lot of other shit and whatever. She's working on whatever. Um, Thank you, Paul. Of course. Uh, before we begin, I just want, as part of this festival, I just want to say a few upcoming programs that will be happening the next, the next few days. Um, tomorrow night at 7.30 at Human Resources, we'll be showing two of Charles's most famous dance works, um, X Romance, a collaboration with Carol Armitage, and Hail the New Puritan, a collaboration with choreographer Michael Clark. On Sunday the 15th um, at 7.30, we'll be at Los Angeles Film Forum at the Egyptian Theater. And, be sh and we'll be showing S Son of Sam and Delilah and Super Honey. These are some of his more darker works. And Charles takes on the intimacy and politics around the AIDS crisis through humor, irony, melancholy, and a lot of fake blood. These are some of his lesser known works. So this is a great opportunity to, to see these films. Um, on Monday the 16th at 7.30 at Human Resources, we return with the film Turning, the concert film documentary, and a critically acclaimed tour by Anthony the Johnsons during the fall of 2006. The no documentary pairs Anthony's songs and Atlas's video portraits of 13 transgender women to explore themes of identity, transcendence, revolution of a revol revolutionary feminine essence. Um, lastly, Charles is also currently in a group exhibition at Parkview Gallery through April 5th. Uh, the title of the show, A New Rhythm. The exhibition includes works by Atlas, Benjamin Carlson, Nancy Lupo, Silka Ananap, and he is screening two videos, Jump and Fraction One. For more information on the full festival, um, you can find that information on atlasinla.tumblr.com. Okay. Now Charles and Laurie. <laughs> okay. Why am I clapping? I'm clapping for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, talking to the mic. Oh, talking to the mic. Um, hi, Charlie. Hi. How are you? Good. Um, uh, what, so, what do you want to talk about? I don't know. What do you want to talk about? Mm, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> um, well, I thought, first of all, I thought I would, I did want to say um, that um, it's Lauren, you who worked on this, right? Mm -hmm. This, it might be, it's right up there in the top. Well, I can't quantify. Let's not get into the um, ancient male ways of weights and measures. But um, <laughs> this is one of the most beautiful um, art books are doc. Uh, it's a, just a beaut a gorgeous book that I believe you laid out mostly, mm. but you and Lauren did it. It is astonishing, and it's um, liberatingly psychedelic in um, a culture which is uh, in which that's forbidden, of course, um, against the law, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I don't know where to begin. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps at the beginning. Just start did, did you, somewhere. Oh, I will start somewhere. <laughs> um, I'm like I'm really jealous of your sister making all that money on the <laughs> on the um, gambling boats in <laughs> St. Louis. You're from St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Charlie's from St. Louis, and um, your work. I've okay. I've known Charlie for we've known each other for about 21, 22 years now. We're part of a little family of friends, and I think that the thing that distinguishes your first of all, Charlie made me not hate dance <laughs> with every fiber of my being, <laughs> and um, because of the psychedelia in, in involved with it, and also the love and the generosity and the beauty and the fact that on film it, or video it became something else, but but then it wasn't. 
only just dances of bodies. It's, it's extended out into every particle of the universe because we're all quantumly entangled and dancing. <laughs> um, and, also, and also, Charlie and I spent um, I don't know, 10 years at the disco <laughs> um, together and um, have collaborated on a number. Why am I making this video about me? <laughs> and, um, and, and Charlie and um, his, the love of his life, Joe Westmoreland's um, pad on 14th Street and 9th Avenue in New York City was like the, the hub where we all went to be, lo to be loved and laugh and, you know, all the freaks, AKA the love machines and, and people would just, it was just joy, always. And Charlie was never not working, <laughs> never. Since 1990, I can't do the math, 94, 21 years. I have never known Charlie to not be working. I, I came over today to um, take a shower in his hotel room because of course I was late. And, um, and Charlie sat down at the computer and started to work again. <laughs> and his entire apartment is filled with banks of, uh, of videos and stuff. I never know what's going to come out of Charlie's brain, never. I'm always surprised and it doesn't, it doesn't lend itself on any level to uh, the gorgeousness and the, it's, like, it's like the way he compo you compose things um, that are very beautiful, but they but they don't they don't seem to start with a preconceived idea that you then or a theory that you then illustrate. It's kind of like Dr. Judy Wood talking about how um, a directed energy weapon destroyed the World Trade Centers, um, a Tesla machine, and she said she I start from the evidence and then I develop the theory. As, and so I. Um, I'm drawing Very a similar. parallel. <laughs> what? Very similar. Would you yeah. like to talk? No. <laughs> um, but how do you... Um, what, uh, okay, let's start this way. Charlie, um, did you grow up caring about dance or what? No. Okay. And, and uh, I... I um, I, when I started working for Merce Cunningham, it was the first contact I had with dance. And, and I started working with Merce Cunningham. I, it was the only dance I'd seen at that point in my life, and I went to see his work because of Bob Rauschenberg's set in costumes. And then I got offered, I was lucky to get offered a job, and then I learned a lot. Okay, so you were designing costumes and set? No, I was, for I, for I, was I was an assistant stage manager. I was blowing up Andy Warhol's silver pillows. Okay, and you were how you came to New York from where? Um, I dropped out of school and Excellent. came to New York. Good work. <laughs> um, and how old? Baby twenties, early yeah. twenties, mm -hmm. and did you have a plan in mind, no. or a no <laughs> thought no that I would be a filmmaker or anything? No. Well, I I liked films, and I I used to go to the films on Forty Second Street all the time, mm -hmm. but um, and I thought I wanted to make films, but I didn't know how I was going to. And then with it was with the dance company that I was first really able to make films, and so that's why I made dance films. And that happened with Merce. With Merce. And, and did he initiate that or he, because he wanted somebody to document his? No, I mean he, uh, at a certain point, I, I was used to go, I had a Super 8 camera and I, I would tour with the company and I would make these films of picnics and of myself in the hotel room and, and then I showed it to the company one, seat, one afternoon after the performances and Merce saw that, and after that he asked me to collaborate with him on video, which I didn't know, I only knew film. And he was making video because it was, it was John Cage's idea, basically, that Merce, if Merce made videos, he wouldn't have to tour anymore, and he could just send the videos out. Mm -hmm. so, it, so that didn't turn out to be the case, but we, we started investigating. I mean, I learned video from a book, from Spaghetti City Video Manual. And I taught it to Merce, and that was the beginning. Uh, the Spaghetti City video manual. Video manual mm -hmm. from? Did you buy it on a blanket on Second? Uh, no, I mean it's, it was a famous <laughs> book at that time in the yeah. '70s. Yeah. Uh, I, I taught a screenwriting class before your time. <laughs> Not much. That was before my time. Um, so, and what was it? 
translating like I've been in plays before where when you watch the videotape, it's a, where the audience is like hysterical with laughter and it's the, most lo it's the biggest love fest in the world or the dancers are the most beautiful thing and then you watch it on videotape and it's the most cold, alienating, horrifying thing in the world. So is that something that you and Merce had to negotiate? Well, no, I mean, we were actually, we, um, we were making videos or films or whatever we were making with dance and the dance didn't pre-exist the film. So I okay. wasn't documenting it. I was working with him, and we, we did a whole summer of just playing around before we made our first film. And then, you know, each, you know, every sort of, I was, worked with him for about, I mean, I was in the, with the company for like 12 years, and I, for 10 of those years, I was making videos, and I made 10 in that time. Of the, the MERS, were you mm -hmm. doing work, uh, other... I was also a stage manager, lighting designer, et cetera. Yeah, because you do costume design as well, right? I, I did, yeah, I have done. Yeah, and I still do lighting for Michael Clark. And Yeah, and stage, and I was just wondering about, I remember you calling me once from, um, I don't know where you were with Marina Abramovich, and you were trying to get 10,000 rats to go mm -hmm. under the, mm -hmm. uh, at the bottom of the Yeah, I collaborated with Marina for a few years. <clears throat> we did a piece called uh, Delusional, which was a solo for her. <clears throat> and we had like 300 rats under a glass stage uh, that was revealed sort of halfway through the piece. And mm -hmm. then she crawled in at the end. And, and then what? And then, the, <laughs> the, and then we got, <laughs> and then we, the, the theater stunk so much. I mean, we, and we had a rat wrangler also, and we had to get the rats back in, out of the stage, and they, they always the, was the one straggler that they would kill. They kill the weakest one, rats. To <laughs> develop survival of the fittest for <laughs> stage purposes? And actually, I had Stage this, rats? I had, uh, no, we used the same rats that uh, Werner Herzog used Whoa. for... Uh, for Nosferatu. Oh, really? We had the same rat wrangler, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> Anytime language is um, stopped in its tracks, then you have succeeded. But um, let's, uh, where should we start? I'm, um, yeah? You, you were to ask me about the numbers. Yeah, I'm really, really obsessed with the numbers thing, and, and uh, he had a, what Which is very atypical work. I mean, I mean yeah, it, in, in 2006, I decided I wanted to do work that didn't look like anything else I'd done before. And so I, um, and I, wanted, I made a two-room installation. And one, I wanted to be as, <laughs> as inhuman as possible. And so I came up with the idea of wanting, making rules and wanting to make a piece about numberness, not numbers, but numberness. And the whole, the whole idea is that whether numbers pre-exist human um, mm. existence or something we discover are invented. And so I really wa didn't want to really use numbers, but then I had no choice <laughs> in the end. But I made, a f the first piece I made was just straight lines and numbers, the numbers one through six. And then I, second piece I made was uh, um, using part, you know, me being much wilder with the numbers and having more fun. And then I yeah, made a big monumental numbers piece. Yeah, because the numbers, the pictures are gorgeous. I mean, the things that the numbers do, they're like living, living vibratory beings. So that basically. was, but that was a, t you know, that's quite different. I mean, I showed, that was the first show that I had in, in New York in a long time. At the, I opened the space in, the Luring Augustine space in, in Bushwick. And it was all the number pieces. And so it called it the illusion of democracy. And um, yeah, it was, it was surprising. Did the title just come to you from, did it, did you just like sort of channel the, did it just well, I was, stumble I was, upon it? You know, they had, um, they needed to have a title, as they usually do, yeah. way before you do the piece. So, um, uh, I just, that was what was on my mind. And I, I thought it was curious that I, you know, I'm a, a progressive political person and, uh, and it's never really entered my work that much. But, um, 
that I was you know, in this dire situation that our country is in, um, I was making abstract pieces. And, I, and so, but, so I, at least with the title, I wanted to address the audience to the political and hopefully have them keep that in mind when they're watching the abstract. Sure, as a, and, but there's a transformation that takes place from us as a, yeah, let me say something really profound. We're all reduced to numbers <laughs> and statistics, and right? Well, people, made, a, people made a connection with that. Yeah, yeah. sure, <laughs> sure. Um, but then they tra it, you, what you've done is transform them into living things, mm -hmm. is, was my feeling about it, because I was just like, and, and there's no way to reduce it to an easy, explanation. Did you come to any conclusions about whether numbers preceded or we made them up or uh, we I, I, I on kind planet of think, Earth? I kind of think, you know, it's like the mathematics of the universe. I mean, I'm, I'm not a mathematician or a physicist, uh, I, although I wish I was, but... Um. Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> we all... <laughs> you are. In, in a way. In yeah. a way. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Well, I remember you. I, I mean, I was really interested in the numbers thing because Charlie and I were obsessed with the X-Files. And I'll never forget when the movie came out and we were sitting in the front row and holding each other's hands. And, and when Mulder and Scully went to kiss, we were like screaming at the top of our lungs. We were like, oh my God! Oh my God! They did it! But then we were really bummed because it ended with the, with the Mary and Jesus and whoever the guy was, Tableau. I think Mulder and Scully had a baby. At the I end of the first movie, remember? I don't, no, I don't remember at all. Am I wrong? <laughs> Anybody remember? Huh? I don't think they got married. I don't think they no. got married, but I feel like they were in this halo of of of. Um, <laughs> what? Bees at the end. I don't remember. I don't remember the ending at all. I only remember holding your hand with a kiss and us <laughs> screaming our heads off. Um, but uh, so uh, let's talk about um, let's start with some of the dance stuff when you moved into like working with Annie and Lucy of Dance Noise. When did you trans? What was the transition period like from well, working with I, Merce? I, well, I worked work, uh, left Merce's uh, company in 1983 after having worked there for 12 years, and um, and then I. Got, you know, because I was working in dance, I was uh, offered a lot of, um, I was offered television projects and, and I could work in Europe because it was not language based. And so I worked with a lot of different, you know, people that I, you know, worked with Carol Armitage and I, then I, through whom I met Michael Clark. And then, um, and so uh, when I started working with these people, I, I, it was all the, all the ten years that I'd spent working with Merce was my learn my classical learning experience, and then I took it into a world that's more of the world that I live in, and uh, so it was able to combine that. And then, so uh, you know, that was I spent some time in London working with Michael and making that film, and then when I came back to New York is when I met. Um, Annie and Lucy of Dance Noise and fell in love with them and started working with them as well. It's usually the way. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it was like a very organic scene. That it was like, I was thinking it was like a, your, what happens with Charlie, what happens with you, Charlie, is, I'm a doctor, <laughs> is um, <laughs> that uh, it grew up very organically. It was a, there was, it was, all, it was very collaborative even though Charlie well, was. Well, it's also like, you know, I've, I've been very lucky to be able to work with my friends and that my friends are so talented. <laughs> I don't so, think that's luck. I think that's yeah, some electromagnetic yeah, gravitational. So, um, and that, you know, um, so I've just continued to do that. Yeah. I mean, I still, you know, find new people to work with. Uh, I was working at the Tate. I was working recently, I was working with these two French dancers, Cecilia Bengalea and Francois Chagnot. And then I'm working with some young dancers on a new project uh, coming up, a 3D, live, pro live 3D project. The 3D thing I'm really excited about. Um, I don't, I've never done it, so I'm really we, looking forward to it. Yeah, and you don't, and do you know what you're, do you have no. any, excellent. <laughs> and uh, the other day you said you like to surprise yourself, and um, I have a whole theory about that, but, but just because, is, 
Well, why? You know, well, um, I don't want to do the same thing. I mean, mostly uh, people want you to do they, what they know you do. And if you want to do something different, you have to find a way to do it on your own. So that's usually what I do. Yeah. And if they want me to do it, um, something I've already done, then I want to be paid a lot of money. <laughs> well, you should be. Yeah, I was, I was always um, astonished that like more people, but now I, it, it, it seems like it's, like, I just wish more people, you know, everywhere in the universe that would see the work because there was nothing like it, like, really being made because there's so much pleasure in it and, um, and, it's, and they're hilarious. Um, so, so you're not caught in this overtly uh, take yourself too seriously. So it opens out into, like, multiple interpretations and multiple narratives are available for you, the viewer, to um, interact and they're very, uh, they're very well, somatic, I, I guess. Um, my natural um, attitude is irony. That's what, what, what I naturally um, tend, tend toward. And, um, you know, sort of undercut, doing something and then undercutting it also. But I had the experience of working with Anthony and the Johnson. I was just going to bring that was, up. <laughs> which was really a, dis a, it was a discipline of, in trying to be sincere. And, and I think I succeeded. You did a good job because I, remember I was going to tell the anecdote when I, um, I didn't, Anthony had moved to town and you were kind of his mentor and I was over there taking a nap. Joe was gone and, and Charlie has a big loft and there's all these speakers all over the loft and I woke up, you know, the afternoon narcotic, you know, psychedelic nap and I woke up in this insanely beautiful song. It was Starfish and at that, I don't know if you know that song by Anthony, it's one of his most beautiful songs that he wrote when he was like, what? seven <laughs> and um it was on a cassette tape which he gave to me but i walked out from and i said who the fuck is this <laughs> and, and it, it, they were like it's anthony and i couldn't even believe it but then but then following that you immediately got into an argument about irony versus sincerity oh and, really and, we yeah, did yeah, even yeah. then oh my god and anthony was brooding about it <laughs> telling tales out of school um and chastising me for taking my mood muffling prozac um <laughs> Uh, but um, uh, that's that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so let's talk about the portraits um, before we get to the live. Well, that was uh, I. I did a, a show. That was my first New York gallery show in 1999. I did. Um, a show of portraits and, and that were of Lee Bowery, Ann Yopes, and Johanna Constantine. And I, you know, they were por portrait installations that really fit in the space. And uh, I just, you know, these are all people that I knew really well and I just got them to my place and we just did something and it, that's what it turned into. And it would, over a period of several days, or would you film? No, I mean, over a period of several months. I mean, you know, Annie came to town, and then I had her come over, and Johanna used to come over regularly, and Lee, it was something that I'd never edited, but I did with him, like, seven years before. It's weird to think about the concept of the portrait, though, like, uh, in your work versus what the concept of the portrait, of just, like, the picture of the person that might convey some static qualities, whereas like well, it's all you know. The, the, I work with performers, it's, it's, and I you know special performers. So yeah, so there's a number of and um, yeah, I don't know. It just seemed like a natural thing to do. What about the use of color and and your attraction to the to the spirals? And is that in the spirit of play and, I know, and I hilarity have, uh, and the. I really like, I don't know why, it's just one of those things, spirals. I love it. <laughs> I like spirals. spirals. Um, I like uh, straight lines and rectangular We forms. like geometry. Like, <laughs> what? We like geometry. I like the basis of everything. Yeah. They used to have healing temples in the, <laughs> the Egyptians had healing temples where if priests would go and diagnose you and then depending on what you had, you'd go into a room and I don't know, maybe you had um, irritable bowel syndrome. So you'd go into this one room and on a plinth in the middle of the room would be a perfect cube. 
you'd sit there and, <laughs> and you'd consider the cube for a while and, and the vibes of the cube, and I'm certain it was constructed with, you know, by aliens. So, um, who knew the principles of vibration and how they work to um, convert your cells into workable things. I don't know, I don't have any, but, um, so I thought uh, geometry is healing. What the <laughs> hell am I talking about? Okay, so, okay, and so do you want to talk about the Times Square? Oh, okay. That's and then we'll get on Super Honey that I was <laughs> done with the girl. Um, well, the Times Square piece just, is, was recent, it was in December, um, the people from Times Square Arts um, approached me to uh, show, they have a thing called Midnight Moment where they, they take over 47 screens in Times Square from 11.57 to midnight every, every night. And um, I don't think it's up there. But um, so I was invited to do it and um, and they wanted to have uh, something, um, they, this video that I had made for you or my sister. So I, I adapted that for the Times Square thing and it was really overwhelming to see um, the women from Turning. They're all, it was all the women from Turning, which um, these sort of really downtown outsider artists and, and transgender women and um, and it, it, we had wor I'd worked with them first in 2004, and now it took till 2014 for them to come from downtown to Times Square. So I was pleased on that level, but at the same time I was kind of um, perplexed by what it meant to be in Times Square. I mean, I felt like, it, the, I wasn't sure, but I felt like it really absorbed my images rather than... Recuperated them back into the dominant area. Well, I mean, because it's really hard, you know, it's an environment that just does that. Yeah. So, I don't know, but I think maybe for other people who, who weren't so personally involved with the images, they might have realized that they weren't Revlon ads. You know. Yeah, I think there's a way of sneaking it into them where you're like planting like a little landmine that's going to detonate later because it's just slightly off in the, in the well, material. Well, I mean, you know, Johanna Constantine and Kimber Fowler are very off. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're so fantastic. They seem like socialist realism to me. It seems like <laughs> realism to me. But they're so magic. But I'm, I'm sorry, do people even know what we're talking about? <laughs> are these people named some of you? Um, I was I was thinking when you were working with Merce, you were also working with um, like Anne Lauterbach, and uh, weren't you working with some of the of the New York poets or or the no, precursors I, to the language poets? Or the no, I was wor I just did one poetry piece, and it was after I left Merce. I mean, oh, okay, it was, it was with Anne Waldman. That's right. That's right. I, um, I was uh, because I was thinking that of the progression from the words thirty years ago to working with words and images. And dance. I mean, yeah, I mean, I know. I just, I just do it as it comes. You know? No, I know. But did you, did you develop a set of um, of, uh, of parameters for yourself to? No, I'm mostly, get going? mostly, I, you know, there was words in my my most recent work, but mostly I don't have, you know, unless people are talking, I don't have words. I mean, the the secret of the waterfall, the piece I did with Ann Waldman and Douglas Dunn. I did learn, you know, it was, instead of music as the accompaniment to the dance, it was poetry. And so it was a pleasure to discover the, how words work and the shape of them and the rhythm of them. And, but I haven't really done that, I haven't done that much with words. Well, we were outside talking, um, <clears throat> pardon me, about, um, uh, I reading, uh, I always like to say this, a physicist, but. PhD the other day who was talking about advanced beings back in the day visiting and the only reason I'm bringing this up is because this guy was talking about Sanskrit as being one of the most um, sort of the language sort of one of the most pu pure languages in terms of um, it, it, an interface between you know our bodies and our, our enmeshment in the world in that letters were, were, it was based on, on the movement and shape of the letters and the way they, and that they had a vibratory level that, and when placed up against each other, 
they would on a, like a kind of a 3D or 11D um, level, send it right onto your nervous system, again, bypassing like any need to like decode. Um, that's original languages, so that the words just, like I have Om Mani Padmi Ham, that, the Buddhist thing, um, tattooed here because, um, well, because it's great, but um, also, um, it looks like a prison tattoo at school, but, um, <laughs> I, but I, you know, in Tibet and Nepal and stuff, they've got, they've got Om Mani Padmi Ham in Sanskrit on, the, um, on rocks and, you know, anything out in nature because you don't need to know what it means technically, for it to uh, have an effect on your body. And so I was thinking about that when we, with, in terms of the numbers and the mm -hmm. numbers moving in the relationship because the numbers were constructed, well, I mean, words were apparently, languages was apparently influenced by each number, each letter. What am I talking about? Each letter <laughs> had a numerical value and a, and a frequency and a, and a hertz level and had, had an effect based on amplitude. And so, you know, um, I just thought that you were working in a channel similar to that intuitively. That's um, what occurred to me. It would, have, it would have to be intuitively because yeah, we don't it's want beyond it. me. <laughs> well, we don't want it from books or because then it's already been, um, it's already been digested and we're being told something, right? Mm -hmm. So talk, talk to me about the, 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 your love of surprise. Uh, um, well, I mean, besides I being bored, it's like, it's it maybe like it is not being bored. Yeah. Yeah. And if I, since I do work all the time, I need some, something to, new to learn and to do and to keep me interested. It's, uh, but I was saying, I think it's a really brave thing to do and it's to take risks like that because you don't know. And, and you said that failures. Well, I, I always, you know, when I'm doing a completely new piece, I can tell that, you know, I, I often feel like, is this the stupidest thing mm. in the world or not? And I, I, that's a good sign. I yeah, think. yeah. When you want to throw up, when <laughs> nobody here has felt that, right? <laughs> is is this the stupidest thing I've ever done? Nobody here is insecure, right? <laughs> it's good that you're sharing that with. Because um, I think that um, I forgot what I was gonna. Well, say. I, I also never, uh, you know, I, I work intuitively and I just sort of try to let either a circumstance or an idea or something just come in and then and then if I start working then I accumulate more things and and meanings accumulate rather than starting with any kind of message or meaning your thesis statement right mm -hmm. that you're going to illustrate so you make you're working with affinities things branch out mm -hmm. so one association leads to another is that well, kind of. Sort of yeah. I mean, sort of. I mean, you're editing uh, while you go along. No, the editing. No, the editing comes later, comes right? Later, yeah. That's just putting it all together, making sense of it. Uh, I keep forgetting what I have to say. Um, where are we? Let's see. That's Johanna. Yeah. You want to talk about Johanna a little bit? Well, she was. Um, How you met her? I met her uh, again fell in love with her on stage. Uh, she's a, a dancer with the Black Limps Performance Cult and a, a group of, a theater group in New York, it was Anthony's group. And um, so I started, you know, I invited her to come over to my house and we just had a regular, she would come over every now and again and put on some outfit or put on some makeup and we'd just do something. Outfit or makeup. <laughs> <laughs> she, <laughs> she's extreme yeah it's very extreme and it's really exciting it's, a, it's really a gift that somebody would do that and love to go out into the world like that and she uh, yeah so I for s several years I worked with her and she's my favorite model I still have worked with her live now you know at the Tate I did a show with her it was live video and uh, in collaboration with the musician well, what about the live stuff? When did what? At what point did that did that come in? Uh, Two thousand three. Okay, do you want to explain that a little bit about how the live stuff worked? Did, did you start that at Jackie, or no, you? no? I start two thousand and three. Um, Douglas Dunn asked me to do video and costumes for um, for a dance he was doing, and I didn't. I thought doing a, a video landscape would be. Um, 
a horrible idea for him to dance in front of a, a landscape of video. So I, I at that time, uh, it was just beginning to be possible to, to do live mixing off a laptop, very rudimentary. But so that's what I pursued and I did a, we did a piece together using three cameras and live mixing and live video uh, and live projection. And that was the beginning and then I did, um, I've used it in a lot of different ways. I did, did an installation called um, Instant Fame where I was in the gallery making live video portraits of whoever came in. You were in it. You came in mm -hmm. playing guitar. Yeah, I sang Do that. Do you remember? I, yeah, I taught myself um, guitar from the internet, and I, I did a masterful rendition of The Needle and the Damage Done. <laughs> it was quite good. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, but I continue to, to work on different ways of, of doing a, a live video, either in installations. I've done these 10 day long installation in London with live mixing the entire time with in c collaboration with Mika Tajima. And this new project that I'm about to start is um, I'm doing a residency at MPAC, which is an upstate experimental media and performing arts center. And I'm doing this um, live 3D cameras with six dancers and live uh, mixing and live video projection in 3D. So all unknowns to me. All unbeknownst to you, you mean all, you don't know uh, any of the people or any of the No, I know, I know the people you know I work people, with. You don't know the, I what's going to happen. I don't know the technology yet. But. Oh, that's the other thing about Charlie. When he's not working, he's constantly learning new, soft, new, new software programs, um, reading, never not reading a, a manual of, you know, HTML, whatever, yeah. whatever it is you crazy nuts use for film. But um, let's see, where do we, where do we want to go next? Because um, I'm not sure what we're showing, so that's why I'm a little confused about where to... Time? We're done? Oh, good! <laughs> Cause I was going to get into the brain surgery next, but <laughs> we'll save that for the next time. Um, I, yeah, yeah, what about... Uh, yeah, what, we would, can, can we talk about tonight's program? You should see every film Charlie has ever made. That, the, what? I don't know. <laughs> tonight's, program, tonight. tonight's program is really uh, very early um, collaborations. Uh, a lot of them are silent, so don't be uh, alarmed when there's no sound. Um, from the early 70s and into the 80s, and then there's just, um, and all dance related. And some of them, uh, I guess the one that, only one that really needs explanation is there's an installation I did in, 2000, I don't know, whatever, seven or something called uh, Joints Quartet for Ensemble, which was a four channel piece um, made out of material that I had shot in 1970 of Merce Cunningham's close ups of his joints. And I turned it into a four channel um, uh, video piece on 10 monitors. And so th what you see on the, on the documentation is at the top you see the installation, although it, it had moving lights in it, moving shadows, but you don't see that. And then at the bottom, there's a strip of the four channels, so you can see what, what actually is the material, but that's just a documentation thing. So maybe we should just... Yeah, I'd like to say something that, that, that against interpretation uh, <laughs> um, or ascribing meaning to something. There's so, because you're exploring things, you often create things that we don't recognize, but the beauty is like so shocking or stunning or it stops you in your tracks and then you have to ask yourself um, until you reach our level of development, okay. Or, you know, if it's okay if we like, if, if you like that, you know, because it hasn't been authorized lately, because you create living creatures or living forms that, like, haven't been seen yet. And in, hopefully. In, in, well, um, you mean it haven't been seen, hopefully by who? Yeah, Lori said humorously. Been seen by anybody. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, in the sense that you create forms that, uh, a form that's constantly morphing and it doesn't stay static because you're seeing where the possibility, you're taking us outside of the, ba of the boundaries that well, we... Well, I think what, what we're going to see tonight is really early work, so... So it's uh, going to be totally formulaic. Yeah, so anyway, 
come, come to some of the other programs, too, to see some later work. And hear somebody so smart can... talk. <laughs> <laughs> that's huh? Okay. Okay, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. yeah.